everyone to our second session of the day in our Climate in Context conference. This session is entitled Historicizing Climate. And this session explores the historical ways of knowing climate from four very different regional, temporal, and I'd say theoretical perspectives. Amid a changing climate, these speakers are going to suggest, I think, that we need to take care to examine how our relationship to climate and our ideas about what climate is have also changed throughout history. Um, so how this session is gonna go is that I'm first going to um, introduce each of our four speakers before each of the speakers presents. Um, and then we'll have questions and discussion about all four of the papers together at the end after the four presentations. Um, so for all of you attendees, you can type in questions in the Q&A box at any time during the presentations, or you can click the little raise hand button, which is actually what we prefer, because if you speak and ask your question, it's a little more human um, than me having to read out your, your question. But if you click that, that raise hand, um, I'll give you priority to, to go ahead and ask your question at the end. Um, and so, uh, yes, I suppose without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, panelist, I'm really excited to have here, Dr. Clark Alejandrino, who teaches at Trinity College. He specializes in environmental history of China, especially its climate and animal history, covering the fifth to the 20th century uh, in his research. Um, so long delay. <laughs> he is currently preparing a book manuscript on typhoons in the history of South China, uh, the South China coast. Um, and he's preparing to embark on a new project exploring the history of migratory birds in East Asia. At Trinity, he teaches uh, courses on Chinese history, on environmental history, world history, and Pacific history. So I'm very excited to, um, to start with his talk, Beyond Numbers, Knowing Typhoons in Late Imperial China. Um, thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Let me just share my uh, presentation. My talk is called Beyond Numbers, Knowing Typhoons in Late Imperial China. Uh, let me just start with this. Um, we, we know climate change today is often conveyed in terms of numbers, numbers like what we have here in front of you. Uh, of course, the 406 is now 420 ppm. And in terms of uh, paleotempestology or the study of past storms, uh, numbers also dominate um, discussion and our understanding of cyclones. We're very interested in past hurricanes, past typhoons, because we wanna know how many such storms occurred in periods of warming and cooling in the hope that in the future, when uh, we'll, we'll have a better idea of um, number of storms and the, the intensity of the storms we're gonna encounter in the future, if, um, in a future scenario of, of warming. We'll also, uh, the study of storms has also been dominated in, by numbers in other ways. Um, we categorize storms in terms of how strong their wind speeds are, how low their barometric uh, pressure, atmospheric pressure readings are. We classify storms in terms of categories one to five, um, from small storms to super typhoons or super hurricanes. But this kind of Counting doesn't make this particular historian happy. So to use uh, a term that David Boyle Pop uh, used to, for his book, um, I often encountered this as a kind of tyranny of numbers. So as I did my research, as I met climate scientists and historical climatologists, other people who were interested in past storms, uh, I often encountered kind of resistance to my research in terms of the fact that Chinese, pre-modern Chinese storms often didn't come with the kind of numbers that um, historical climatologists um, of hurricanes in the Atlantic in particular would often use to count their storms and identify storms in the past. So I studied this part of China, the South China coast, uh, in particular the province of Guangdong, but typhoons, hurricanes also hit parts of Eastern China like uh, the region of Shanghai. And the kind of sources I use um, look something like this. And there are very, um, there's this word in Chinese called 
2, which often occurs in these documents, they don't come with the kind of numbers that historical climatologists like to have in order to identify a hurricane or a typhoon, um, but they come with certain qualitative descriptions which can which we can use to identify them as typhoons. So these, uh, this word G often comes with the description of it being involving the wind of the four directions. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these descriptions. I've kind of summarized them all in the paper, which was pre-circulated. But by what I say in the paper is that by late imperial times for the Ming and Qing periods, um, people were actually able to identify the, the very distinctive counterclockwise circulation of a Northern Hemisphere typhoon. It also, this word also comes with all kinds of um, descriptions of what we know today as a typhoon's destructive wind power and uh, rainfall. Also the timing that, of this thing called G uh, coincides with what we know about uh, when a typhoon is typhoons and are normally active in the Northwest Pacific. So in the summer and the early autumn, um, so Chinese sources would describe how um, G or typhoons occur normally in the sixth to the ninth lunar months, which coincide with around June to October in the solar calendar. Um, and historical climatologists, particularly in China, are quite open to using these records to for counting typhoons. Um, the resistance I've encountered has, mo has mainly been when I'm interacting with historians of hurricanes in the Atlantic, they normally tend to reject these records, these Chinese records as having um, no quantitative um, basis. I've also um, highlighted in the paper how these, uh, taking seriously these kinds of Chinese terms for storms and the accompanying texts that go with them um, give us an idea of how people in the past, particularly in this part of the world, understood storms and how they coped with them. So for example, people developed quite interesting ways of predicting typhoons in the absence of modern meteorological instruments. And so you have here on the left, for example, um, this uh, plant called the wind, which coastal peoples uh, in China knew as the wind blowing plant. They literally called it the wind blowing plant because uh, if you count the number of lines on the leaves of this plant every year, at the start of the year, uh, it was said to be able to predict the number of typhoons that would arrive in that year. So if you counted three lines and there would be three typhoons, if you saw two lines, it would be two typhoons. And the assumption was that every single plant had the same number of lines every year. So you could pick any plant and, and figure out how many typhoons would come. On the right, you have the storm petrel, which is a bird species common across coastal China. And uh, sources will tell you that people looked at the behavior of these birds. And if they noticed these birds flying inland towards the mountains, then you could, you could use that as a sign that the, a typhoon was coming. Uh, people also had uh, all kinds of interesting cultural adaptations uh, in the Pit Peninsula of Leizhou, which is in southern China. Uh, people would use uh, stone dogs uh, that you see here and use this to mark their homes because what, when a typhoon passes through and brings down homes, sometimes it's difficult to know whose home or whose property it is after a storm is kind of brought down everything. But these stone dogs were quite unique. Every single household had their own kind of stone dog and these would not be brought down by a typhoon and people could go back to, to their homes and figure out where their homes were by looking for their own distinctive stone dogs. Uh, in other parts of coastal China, uh, uh, people would build uh, the architecture of their homes would reflect as well adaptations to these things called tree or typhoons. Um, these homes have this kind of um, decorated uh, stone block at, at the edge of their roofs, roofs. And these were said to stabilize the roof. Um, the locals told me that these were used to stabilize the roofs 
uh, in case of a typhoon. It, it's a design that goes all the way back to the late imperial times, and you can still see them today uh, when you visit uh, south, uh, Southeast China. And as I also mentioned, uh, oftentimes these typhoons found their way into historical narratives in very surprising ways, um, not necessarily as uh, narratives of destruction. Often typhoons are an opportunity for locals to display their virtues, um, Confucian virtues of filial piety or chastity. So I describe a case where one woman who refused to leave her husband's uh, um, grave, uh, to the purse um, during a typhoon uh, was given a chastity arch, a memorial chastity arch by uh, the emperor. Um, this is one example of a chastity arch, not necessarily of that, that woman I described, but uh, at least one of my sources describes a woman being given such an arch, such an honor because of uh, her braving a typhoon. And uh, as I mentioned in the paper, um, we need to take seriously these kinds of sources, even they, though they might not give us the same kinds of quantitative information that some historical climatologists demand of them, because uh, paleotempestology is still an emerging science. Uh, we're still not quite um, there yet in terms of the methods for identifying storms through proxy evidence. All kinds of problems arise uh, when uh, in trying to determine uh, sedimentation caused by a hurricane. Sometimes we have to distinguish between hurricanes, uh, sedimentation, and tsunamis or other kinds of similar phenomenon. And it's not yet uh, as exact a science as one would like, though it's heading in a promising direction. And so, and that's why most paleotempatologists still rely on uh, historical documents. And, but there's a privileging of Western kinds of documentation of storms. And that has been my experience. And I've been trying to argue that uh, we should not allow modern meteorological standards to dictate what kinds of sources are useful for us um, to understand uh, storms in the past, especially in places outside of Europe and Amer the Americas. So in conclusion, I wanted to stress in that paper the importance of recognizing qualitative sources and what they can reveal about the society's relationship to climate and weather. I argued for not allowing a fetish for numbers in particular interests of certain climatologists to deny the value of sources that were not made, that were not made to suit their research agendas. And I wanted to recognize that the meanings given by society to climate and weather are just as important for us moving forward as knowing the numbers that inform our knowledge of climate. And there, thanks. Thank you so much, Clark. Um, that's a really important talk, I think. And it has some great resonances, I think, with the next talk. So um, next, I'm very happy to introduce my colleague here at UT. Dr. Jorge Cañizares Esquerra. He is the Alice Drysdale Sheffield Professor of History here at the University of Texas at Austin. And he's actually going to be next year's incoming Institute for Historical Studies director. His most recent publications include two volumes that appeared in 2018, Entangled Empires, the Anglo-Iberian Atlantic, 1500 to 1830, as well as Encounters Between Jesuits and Protestants in Asia and the Americas <clears throat> that same year. He's also currently working on two more books, Categories as Prisons and The Radical Spanish Empire. And so I'd like to welcome Jorge for the second talk in our series. Uh, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Erica, for the invitation. Um, that was a fascinating talk, Clark. Um, uh, mine is not uh, about the same topic, but it's about um, how these uh, traditions of uh, the the genealogical traditions of the uh, the genealogies, intellectual genealogies of the Anthropocene, um, are being created. That one of the most important figures in um, the historiography, not only as uh, the individual who introduced ecology and environmentalism, 
and played a significant role in the spread of environmentalism in the 19th century, particularly in the United States and in Europe, um, leading to all these aesthetical traditions of uh, the Hudson School of River, uh, Hudson River School, uh, and other uh, ways of understanding the cosmos is Alexander von Humboldt. So here you have Alexander von Humboldt um, and his friend uh, Ame Bonpoint in the Orinoco. It's a painting from the 1850s uh, in Germany that show these young uh, um, German Prus Prussian um, engineer, mining engineer um, Humboldt with his friend Bonpland in the Orinoco. And what you can see from uh, the picture is that they are surrounded by plants, surrounded by uh, botanical uh, instruments of all kinds, telescopes, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, but they, 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 there is nobody else. Uh, it, it is Northern Europe, objects, animals, and the global South disappears, or it's only represented as tarantulas or as plants. Um, is this a space to be uh, discovered, to be um, interpreted? And Humboldt went to this space uh, to, uh, to do that. And one of the most important biographers recently of um, Alexander von Humboldt is Andrea Wolfs. Uh, that has won about 25 different uh, awards uh, worldwide in the United States, Germany, France, Europe, China included. Um, probably some of you have read the, uh, the, the book in English translations, but it's been translated to, to several languages. And the main uh, argument of uh, Andrea Wolf's um, Alexander von Humboldt and the invention of nature is that the invention of nature essentially is uh, Humboldt's great contribution. The invention of nature is uh, the understanding of nature um, as a whole but also the understanding of nature as uh, a threatened environment. And so he presents, or she presents uh, Humboldt as the creator of the category of the Anthropocene. Uh, it's the new hero, of our, it's a new hero for our times. And therefore she sold the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of copies of this book. Um, she goes into politics, she goes into the politics of um, environmentalism uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century to Humboldt. And one of the arguments of her book is that uh, Humboldt uh, was a radical, radical uh, in his critiques of uh, slavery, uh, but radical particularly in his critique of the Spanish American empire because he was invited to, into Spanish America. Uh, his observations and his publications are about his expeditions in Spanish America for five years. He went to first to the Caribbean, well, the Canaries, then the Caribbean, then Venezuela, then Colombia, uh, then Peru, finally Mexico. And he wound up in Pennsylvania uh, you know, in a conversation with Jefferson, gave him information about Mexico. So he spent five years altogether in Spanish America. And his argument, uh, uh, in addition, to his critiques of colonialism and, and slavery is that Spanish America was a place that was particularly backwards and uh, bad representative of colonialism because it had wrecked the environment. It was not only the exploitation of labor in the mines, but it was the um, reckless uh, destruction of nature as well. Um, he's known for uh, his analysis of Lake, um, uh, Lake. let me give you exactly the name. I am trying to deal with two different screens and it's a problem. Lake, it's a, a Lake Valencia in, um, in uh, Venezuela. And uh, it's an interpretation of how uh, humans, and uh, the exploitation of the environment creates, wreaks havoc on nature and leads to um, destruction of nature as a manifestation of colonialism and capitalism. And then he has also the model of uh, the current of Humboldt, the model of why climate changes improve, uh, why is deserted, why uh, the currents are the way they are, 
and through use by using the currents and understanding uh, the environment of desertic Peru and the Andes, he's allegedly um, the creator of, uh, of this model of uh, environmental um, climatology called uh, the Humboldt Current. Um, all these ideas are wonderful. They are in the book by Andrea Wolf, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that they are all wrong. Uh, the problem is that they are all um, false. The problem is one of um, epistemological colonialism. Um, Humboldt is a guy who never uh, imagined was going to the Andes. He had ideas of going to, uh, in an expedition to the Pacific uh, with the French. He prepared to go there. He lost uh, the ship in the last minute, and then he embarked on a trip to the Canaries um, completely um, serendipitously. So he wasn't prepared for his encounter with the Andes. He had not uh, studied the Andes. He had not studied America. He had other intentions. He was um, an individual trained in, in Freiburg uh, in mineralogy. Uh, and um, he arrived in um, places like Ecuador. This is the Chimborazo, this view of the Chimborazo. And you can see the sensibilities not only of uh, the century, 19th century, uh, somebody like Frederick Church, but of Humboldt himself. So he encounters the natives uh, and he, his main concentration is with the environment, with nature, with the great mountains, um, particularly the Chimborazo. Uh, but he erases himself. Not only Alexander, um, uh, uh, Andrea Wolf erases uh, the intellectual communities of the Spanish America, but Humboldt himself erases in his own treatises uh, entire cities. So be between uh, Humboldt and the Cotopaxi, there stands here a city, a huge city on this plain. And that city is called Riobamba. It's a city of about half a million people now. At the time, well, probably were 30,000, 35,000 people. And that magically disappears from, from this map as the intellectual communities of Spanish America disappear completely from Alexander, from Andrea Wolf's book. Um, Alexander von Humboldt is known for his um, map of the Chimborazo. Of, he has ascent to the Chimborazo, alleged ascent to the Chimborazo, uh, in which he uh, correlates heights with different types of plants and different types of um, uh, geog plant geographies um, uh, in general. So he kind of moves uh, botany from, from linear individuals to plant uh, economies or ecologies or plant geographies. Um, this map, of course, uh, is the product of two days of his ascent to Chimborazo, uh, not very well uh, known environment. Uh, we know that most of his uh, ideas about uh, mapping the Chimborazo come from his encounter with Caldas, uh, scientists from Nueva Granada who have been uh, doing this type of study of uh, heights and different uh, plant eco ecologies or plant uh, populations. Uh, uh, for a year or more, and his maps are far much more sophisticated than, than Humboldt's. Um, he had spent years in, in these mountains, not a day or two. Um, and Humboldt takes these ideas and he doesn't cite uh, Caldas at all in his plant, uh, his geography, uh, geography of plants. There's no citation to Caldas. So it's the whole politics of citation in which entire communities are erased not only from maps, from, but from the uh, map of knowledge. Um, we know of his isothermic uh, lines, very important to uh, his science. Um, and the idea is that Humboldt was the first one to have use graphics and different instrumentation in order to put together different data uh, to create global maps of global phenomena. That is, of course, nonsense. Here you have uh, Medina's uh, treaties on how to um, gather information in order to do mapamundis. 
And it's essentially the same strategy, different systems of collecting data with different instrumentation. Uh, here he has, Medina has uh, five different systems, including the direction of uh, uh, different currents of air, uh, uh, the position of the moon, position of the stars, position of the sun, and position of the lodestone uh, in relationship to your location, which leads to the, to the creation of global maps, just in the way as, as Humboldt uh, created isothermic lines graphically. Um, well, this is the whole Humboldt current uh, that I just refer. Um, now, my point here is that, and let me read briefly two things, uh, is that um, both Andrea Wolf and Humboldt erase uh, entire intellectual communities from uh, Spanish America. Um, so for instance, um, the literature on Humboldt is relentless in its colonialism and the deliberate effort to silence and skip do memorialization. Uh, this should surprise no one for, uh, for Humboldt himself dismissed the Spanish American intellectual communities he encountered, encountered on his trip. Quote, in Lima, I learned nothing of Peru, end quote. Humboldt declared in 1803 in a letter to a correspondent. As Greg, Greg Cushman has shown, that this statement was both accurate and patently false. Humboldt simply assumed that Spanish colonialism destroyed the environment. Humboldt concluded, for example, that the overgrazing erosion and other collective mismanagement irrevocably transformed Lake Valencia in coastal Venezuela. Local Venezuelans knew better, however. Um, locals had seen the waters of the lake dry up before in recurrent regional cyclical droughts. Uh, Humboldt had these testimonies, but he ignored them as obscurantist nonsense. Humboldt had the same wrong interpretation of dryness in coastal Peru. He blamed it on local ecological colonialism. The menu intellectuals, however, had accumulated for decades vast amounts of observations. Their interpretation of climate did not fit Humboldt's, so the Prussian dismissed them. The menu climatologists offer a much global interpretation of Peru's coastal des the deserts than Humboldt. Hippolito Unanue, for example, figured out the interactions among north south north oceanic circulation, equatorial warmth air currents, and the Andean heights to interpret coastal desertification and Andean patterns of rain. In fact, it was Unanue who described the oceanic current we now know as Humboldt's. Humboldt eventually embraced Unanue's model, but most surprisingly, European scholars read Humboldt, not Unanue, and wrongly attributed to the Prussian the priority of discovery, quote unquote. Humboldt did nothing to correct the mistake. Um, I am, am I running? Oh, yeah, I am, I have two more minutes. One more minute, okay. Uh, the last point I was trying to make is that this idea of a global science that Humboldt introduces also, there's no novelty. It, it began in the 1500s uh, with the Spaniards. It began in the Middle Ages with Sacro Bosco's sphere. It began with uh, Aristotle's meteorology. Um, the idea of uh, changes uh, in climate due to the transformation of earth, water, fire, uh, um, et cetera. Um, now, in Spanish America, uh, this is the map that I, that I suggested through observation that is, it's Humboldtian science. Um, it's a model of Humboldtian science. But in, 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 in Spanish America, there is a tradition of understanding um, uh, these global patterns, ecological global patterns, because they had this model of of Aristotle's meteorology. And so you have a tradition of many printed books uh, that anticipate many of the things that we attribute now to Humboldt. And I have some examples of that here, the natural history uh, of the Indies of uh, Acosta that anticipates most of the ideas of Humboldt on the Andes. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea of tides, these, these maps of tides come from treatises by the Portuguese on the global study of tides. Um, and there are two of them uh, in the early uh, 1600s. And I'm done with that, thanks.
I'm really sorry to cut you off in 15 minutes, but we can all discuss uh, a bit more in, in the discussion too. Um, I'm gonna now introduce our third panelist. Um, and this will bring us into 20th century uh, climate science. Our third panelist is Dr. Melissa Cherenko. She is assistant professor in the Lyman Briggs, Lyman Briggs College of the Department and the Department of History at Michigan State University. And she's also one of uh, this year's residential Residential from Afar Fellows of the Institute for Historical Studies here at UT Austin. Her work explores scientists' diverse understandings of climate and how they arise from the ways scientists encounter and measure climate. She's interested in how scientists use climate proxies like fossil pollen or tree rings in order to understand the Earth's climate and the role of proxies in foreseeing future climates as well. And this work is gonna appear in her book that she's working on a finalized manuscript as we speak, uh, Science as Prophecy, Measuring Past and Future Climates, which is under contract with the University of Chicago Press. So, uh, Melissa, go ahead. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you for everyone who's made my time at the Institute for Historical Studies so wonderful. I'm so pleased with this conference that's sort of the culmination of this year um, and to continue to learn from you all. Um, so, in 1938, University of Michigan geographer Stanley D. Jodge wrote a piece for science. There it is, uh, where he questioned prevailing ideas about climate. Since the 19th century, the dominant view of climate had come from climatology. Those subscribing to climatological views believe that climate comprised the typical weather conditions of a region. On the human timescales of interest to clim climatologists first employed in the service of expansive empires, climate was a stable entity. Climate varied across space, but not time. After surveying the recent literature on climate, Dodge became dissatisfied with climatological views, and he summarized a bunch of these different findings in this piece for science. So according to Dodge, who had looked at fossil pollen, which had shown rather profound changes in climatic conditions to have been taking place during the last three to 500 years. He also surveyed work on tree rings, which have signaled climatic irregularities over shorter time periods. Lastly, on longer timescales, he looked to varves, visibly distinct paired layers of clay and silt representing summer and winter deposition into lakes, which had shown fluctuations of climate in immediately post Pleistocene, so since the last ice age times and for considerable periods since. Dodge summarized this various work by saying, the view that which must arise from the consideration of this evidence is that climate is not in a state of continuous fluctuation, is in a state of continuous fluctuation and change. It is not static. It varies from year to year, from decade to decade, and from millennium to millennium. The evidence that Dodge was citing for climate's dynamism would, today, would today be known as a climate proxy. Climate proxies are the preserved physical characteristics of past climates that stand in for direct meteorological measurements. These natural recorders of climatic variability allow scientists to reconstruct climatic conditions over the vast stretches of Earth's history for which we do not have instrumental measurements. There are many climate proxies, so I introduced the first three when I talked about Dodge's piece, but others that many people work with these days include ice cores and foraminifera and diatoms, which are types of marine um, organisms whose composition tell us something about the environment. In each of these cases, when the proxy indicator grew or was deposited, it was influenced by particular climactic elements, such as temperature or precipitation. Once scientists perform secondary studies to calibrate the proxy to the climatic element of interest and verify conclusions against other proxies or against uh, instrumental measurements, scientists can use the proxy to reconstruct past environments. So my larger project explores climate proxies and how scientists understand them. And I'm interested at all stages of knowledge production by proxy. So these are just a few of the steps involved with dating, uh, with using fossil pollen as a climate proxy. In my talk today, I want to explore some of the challenges and possibilities of measuring by climate proxies, especially ideas about climate futures. I'm gonna look at two ideas about climate that emerge from proxy work. First, we're gonna to turn to the first decades of the 20th century when Andrew Ellicott Douglas developed a method to infer precipitation from tree rings. 
His work reveals some of the challenges of turning an indirect measure of past climates into a reliable precipitation gauge, along with excitement that the technique might predict the future. My second example looks at pollen analysis in the 1980s when scientists developed the modern analog technique to study future climates. Although scientists expressed similar excitement about the predictive capacity of the technique, um, the so-called novelty of future climates given greenhouse gas emissions diminished the technique's foresight according to these scientists. Okay, so to my first example. Andrew Ellicott Douglas was an Arizona-based astronomer interested in finding meteorological variations believed to be caused by fluctuations in the sun's energy. Douglas knew that tree, rings, uh, tree growth was partially dependent on photosynthesis rates, which was itself tied to solar activity. Douglas thought that tree growth might track solar activity, so he began examining the stumps of recently logged trees throughout Arizona. By the 1910s, Douglas had developed a method that used tree rings to reconstruct meteorological conditions. Douglas used several inferences to turn tree rings into indices of climates of the past, as he called them. First, Douglas posited that the tree rings measure a tree's food supply. He then suggested that food supply depends largely upon the amount of moisture, especially in this dry climate, where the quantity is limited and the life struggle of the tree is against drought rather than against competing vegetation. From these inferences, Douglas concluded that tree rings measure precipitation. In wet years, the trees would grow more quickly, resulting in thicker rings. In dry years, the rings would be thinner because the tree's growth would be slower. But this description of Douglas's work elides the labor needed to interpret the climate signal reflected by the variable thickness of rings. Scientists realized that there could be much confusion from the technique, ranging from trees with double or false rings or species whose rings had little relationship with climate at all. And this occurs especially in the tropics. Uh, through secondary studies of trees and their growth, scientists determined which species were best at tracking rainfall. In the Southwest, ponderosa pine acted as a particularly good rain gauge or chronograph. But successful tree ring measurement required more than selecting a species whose growth reflected precipitation. Scientists also needed to select trees that did not have regular access to groundwater, which might minimize precipitation's effects on trees. Trees under stress are more sensitive in their tree series. As scientists learned in the Southwest, the trees most sensitive to moisture grew at forest borders and on rocky steep and south facing slopes. But even with sensitive trees, scientists needed to ensure that non-climactic factors such as shading from other trees and defoliation by insects or fire were not influencing growth. The recognition of the role of non-climactic factors in influencing tree rings speaks to a challenge with working with proxies more broadly. How could scientists distinguish the climate signal that they're interested in and that's reflected by the proxy um, from the noise and the other influence of, um, other, of other environmental factors without circular reliance on conclusions from the proxy itself? Methodological questions like these plagued proxy work at the same time as there was a great deal of excitement about the climactic insights, um, especially about climate shifts that we saw with Dodge, as well as this future that um, I'm going to turn to now. So in the interwar period, tree rings were particularly promising given their potential to forecast. As tree ring methods charted rainfall over time, scientists began to see cyclical patterns in the precipitation data. Cycles offered possibilities for prediction. By knowing where one was in the cycle, you could say what meteorological conditions would come next. As Douglas wrote, when the, a real theory of climate has been developed and we can predict drought and flood over a period of years, this Arizona story in tree rings will have played a credible part in developing that climactic foresight. With this claim, Douglas was displaying an interwar optimism in scientific prediction through quantification. The chronology offered by tree rings displayed climactic cycles. Knowing that a drought was likely, modern civilizations could escape some of climate's worst effects by adapting to the conditions to come. So I want to contrast this early version of proxy science and the foresight with um, uh, pollen analysis as it's practiced in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, um, pollen workers proposed the modern analog method. It was a form of inference in which two entities that are alike in some respects are assumed to be similar in other respects as well. 
The method, method assumed that if through statistical means, scientists found a similarity between an assemblage or a community of fossil pollen and a modern vegetation community, they could assume the two communities had similar properties and dynamics. By the 1980s, aided by computer algor algorithms for multivariate analysis, pollen analysis pollen analysts had formal numerical matching tools that could statistically determine the similarity of fossil and modern pollen assemblages. This method allowed them to determine which samples were actual analogs and then make inferences about the past given their observations of the modern community. So you have this uh, present past relationship in the analog technique. So while the analog technique could provide details about the past, the 1985 paper that introduced this test um, also realized that there were situations where there was no modern analogs. So where there were past communities didn't look anything like the, uh, like the present. And scientists developed these, uh, which are noted in red, the no analogs. Um, and at particular moments of change, they seem to suggest that there was no analogs. They identified past no analog situations using a variety of different terms. And so here you can see the different ways that they talked about these analogs. These words all emphasized how various species had assembled and reassembled themselves in the past in ways different from the present. Yet, because scientists increasingly recognized that over the last 20,000 years, which is typically the time frames they're thinking on, um, the climate and vegetation had gone through continuous patterns of change. They viewed this reshuffling as part of a normal process of change. These shifts were so common through geological time that some scientists called the term climactic change redundant because the climate was always shifting on the timescales they're looking at. Past no analog communities were compositionally dissimilar to modern communities, but represented a normal environmental response to a changing climate. But in the early 1980s and 90s, around the same time that pollen analysts located no analog situations in the past, climate modelers began predicting that due to human influence, the Earth's temperature would rise. With global uh, warming anticipated, scientists speculated that future no analog communities would arise given anthropogenic change. So this future no analog method as it looked similar to the past one. Instead of using the present to understand the past, pollen analysts would use the past to understand likely future dynamics. In, this, in practice, this meant finding veg vegetation communities that had existed under the climatic and atmospheric conditions predicted because of elevated greenhouse gas concentrations. For example, scientists could use communities that resulted from the higher temperatures during the middle of the Holocene warm period as an analog for communities uh, to come in a warming world or they could use other periods of rapid, climate, rapid warming, such as those experienced at the end of the Younger Dryas um, about 20,000 years ago. Some thought that the future analog method was an improvement over some of the things we normally talk about as historians of science. So mathematical models used to capture fundamental physical principles of earth systems. Um, critics of modeling believe that models didn't actually um, accurately predict future change. There are too many uncertainties because of scientists' incomplete understanding of the mechanisms involved. But the analog method actually brought many of these ideas together, allowing to account for things like vegetation, which the models were not particularly good at. Uh, given the possibilities of knowing about future communities, given analogs, uh, analogies with present ones, scientists saw the analog method as a valuable predictor of the future. But not all was well for the predictive analog method especially given scientists' beliefs that the future would be unprecedented because of human-induced climate change. Humans were forcing the climate into new states. Pollen analysis described future analog, future no analog situations differently than they described those in the past. Now they were emerging and novel, and this signaled a discontinu discontinuity from that which came before. With this sense of rupture, there was little place for history or methods which relied on the past to understand the present or future. Given the no analog uh, future, pollen analysts came to discuss the diminished predictive power of the analog method. For instance, a 2007 article on novel climates and no analog communities stated, at worst, we maybe only predict that many novel communities will emerge and surprises will occur. This proclamation emphasized a very different role for future-oriented proxy science. 
Rather than forecasts of the climate of the years ahead, Douglas had hoped for with tree rings, proxy scientists fretted, uh, fretted about predictions writ large. They largely reconfigured their field away from these quantified predictions, focusing instead on model verification and cautionary tales using scenario building, given their knowledge of the past. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, this moves us to our uh, final speaker for this panel. And I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Deborah Cohen. She is professor of history and chair of the program in history of science and medicine at Yale University. There, she's also a member of the steering committee of the environmental humanities program. Her research focuses on the history of the modern physical and earth sciences and the intellectual and cultural history of central Europe. She's the author of the earthquake observers, disaster science from Lisbon to Richter, and most recently of the I would say absolutely magisterial book, <laughs> Climate in Motion, uh, Science, Empire, and the Problem of Scale. So I'm very happy to have Deborah be our uh, fourth speaker. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and thank you for organizing. So I wanna start um, just by observing what might be obvious that the scientific study of climate change necessarily involves knowledge of our own vulnerabilities. And I want to ask what kind of a scientific object is human vulnerability? So um, let me see if I can advance my slides. Huh. Okay, um, I have a bit of a delay. Um, um, any su suggestions for um, is it, is the delay happening just on your on your screen? In terms do, I mean, of do you do you see a change of the slide? Haven't seen no. a change of the slide. No. Try the bottom left corner, Debbie. That's where I needed to hit to advance. Bottom left. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. okay. Um, so the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992 committed wealthy countries to assist developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. The concept of vulnerability has come to play several key roles in climate science and policy over the past two decades. It functions as a conceptual tool for understanding the dynamical interactions between the Earth's climate and ecological and social systems. It informs the setting of targets and limits for greenhouse gas emissions, it supports work towards climate justice by shifting research and resources to the most vulnerable populations. It helps identify appropriate adaptation strategies to reduce risk to those groups. And it supports legal action against greenhouse gas emitters through estimates of loss and damage. But there is no widely agreed upon method for measuring and assessing climate vulnerability. These are some examples of attempts to map vulnerability of different populations to different effects of climate change. And I just wanna point out the very different scales and different purposes of these maps. Measures of vulnerability are highly scale dependent and there are ambiguities to aggregating data across geographic scales. So how does the vulnerability of the household relate to that of the region or the nation? Some measures of vulnerability start with climate model predictions of impacts, while others start from socioeconomic indicators. And different definitions of vulnerability may well be appropriate for different purposes. Despite all the talk of climate vulnerability today, few have viewed the concept through a historical lens. So what follows is a proposal to do so, offering some preliminary insights from research I've just begun. And I have to say, as a historian of 19th century Europe, as Megan mentioned, I'm a newcomer to many of the topics I'm going to be discussing, and I welcome critical feedback. So the concept of climate vulnerability has developed since the 1970s at a nexus between disciplines that might otherwise never have encountered each other, atmospheric science, critical geography, political ecology, development economics, human rights law, and feminist epistemology. I will argue that the efforts to define vulnerability have constituted a vital and necessary conversation 
about the role of values in scientific inquiry. For the question of who, who is vulnerable is the question of what people value and therefore want to protect. At the start of the 1970s, it seemed a safe bet that the decade would see a global decrease in human vulnerability to climate, thanks to the drought resistant seeds of the, the Green Revolution. Then came the oil embargo and the perception of an energy crisis in much of the industrialized world, followed by the Three Mile Island accident, which saw the political death of the nuclear alternative to fossil fuels in the US. And then there was the weather. In the early 70s, many West Africans faced a devastating drought. Peruvian fisheries saw the collapse of the anchovy population and the USSR was forced to import grain after the failure of its harvest. Um, at the time, scientists were just beginning to connect the dots and trace the unusual weather to the strong El Nino event of 1972 to three. So unexpectedly, the 1970s became the decade when industrialized societies first confronted their own vulnerability and began to pose the question of whether development might actually be increasing the vulnerability of poorer nations. This reckoning seemed to require new ways to observe, measure, and compare vulnerability across space and time. Among the vulnerabilities that wealthy nations were forced to confront in the 1970s were the effects of anthropogenic global warming. Initially, the study of human vulnerability to climate change was pursued primarily by those trained in geography in the subfield of hazards research. Hazards research identified social factors that paved the way for catastrophe from the design of the built environment to economic insecurity. In 1979, the geographer Bob Cates brought the lessons of hazards research to the attention of the first World Climate Conference. Cates contrasted his analysis of global warming with those of presenters at the conference who had focused on the uncertain evidence for an anthropogenic component to recent climatic trends. He observed the quote, disarray of the atmospheric theory of forcing mechanisms by contrast, the knowledge of the impact of greenhouse gases, um, uh, sorry, of human responses to weather hazards was more robust at the time than natural scientific knowledge of the impact of greenhouse gases on the climate. Um, he, he joked that as a social scientist outnumbered by natural scientist, he, um, he did not feel soft at all. So Cates' argument opened the door to a new science of climate vulnerability. In his terms, it would be a human-oriented atmospheric science. This ambition was reflected in the research goals adopted by the World Climate Conference. Quote, um, as you can see here, right, determining um, the characteristics of human societies that make them especially vulnerable. But how was climate vulnerability to be measured over time and across societies? What were the relevant indicators? How could data be generated to reveal conditions that governments and industries had good reason to hide? Hazard researchers had defined a population's vulnerability by holding the hazard constant while measuring variations in response across social units and over time. So for instance, they took the magnitude of an earthquake or the wind speed of a hurricane and compared those numbers to damage on the ground such that excess damage was the measure of relative vulnerability. In this way, epistemically, vulnerability connected biogeophysics with social science. Morally, it mediated between empirical and normative questions. But a hazard is a discrete event, while global warming is not localizable in space or time. Climate is not a variable that can be held constant for the sake of comparing impacts at different locations or different historical moments. In short, the problem of measuring climate vulnerability threw into relief some of the unique challenges that global warming poses to the methods of modern science, or more precisely, to the workarounds that science falls back on when facts and values collide. Reckoning with climate change would mean rethinking the scientific meaning of human vulnerability. That process was sidelined in the 1980s, though, in the face of resistance from the Reagan and Thatcher administrations. Atmospheric scientists focus squarely on estimating the global average temperature change to be expected from a doubling of atmospheric carbon dioxide, while policymakers focused on strategies of mitigation, meaning reducing the buildup of greenhouse gases. The study of climate impacts 
um, now known as the study of adaptation, was widely stigmatized in the 80s as a moral hazard. So my hypothesis, in a nutshell, is that the science of human vulnerability to climate change was driven by new political alliances formed at this time. Liberal feminists of the global north entered into dialogue with indigenous and global south feminists in the 1980s and 90s. And together, they began to remake the broad concept of vulnerability. In the hands of hazards and development researchers, vulnerability had been a stigma projected onto populations who had no say in its definition. Global feminism called for its redefinition and invited a diversity of voices into the debate. No longer was it acceptable to assume that vulnerability was simply cause for humanitarian intervention. In other words, my hypothesis is that the rise of a self-consciously global feminist movement helped motivate a radical rethinking of climate science. Here, I can sketch only a few examples to illustrate how feminist thought came to resonate with the conceptual and methodological problems of turn of the millennium climate science. Vulnerability was theorized in this period by loosely linked communities of feminist thinkers. Um, and I've listed some examples here um, to illustrate um, uh, as chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Sheila Watt Cloutier pointed out that the UNF Triple C didn't even mention the Arctic as an area vulnerable to climate change. She and other indigenous activists didn't just add the Arctic to the list of vulnerable areas, they helped to redefine the meaning of vulnerability. Wachlutier insisted that those who are vulnerable, including indigenous women, be recognized as keepers of relevant knowledge. Subsequently, indigenous feminists like Deborah McGregor and Robin Wall Kimmerer began to push back against the tendency to distort indigenous knowledge to fit Western epistemological frameworks, helping to shape the emerging concept of traditional ecological knowledge. Martha Nussbaum's moral theory posited vulnerability as the very foundation of human excellence. She broke with the Kantian assumption that for an action to be moral, it must be a will to act independent of external contingencies or luck. Instead, she argued that human values, our potential to live a good life, begin with our attachments to ephemeral objects and circumstances. In other words, with our vulnerabilities. The image Nussbaum chose to sum up this view was that of human excellence as a growing plant, vulnerable to weather, as you see um, in the quotation here. This was an insight that led her to ask whether the conditions for a good life could be universalized to protect the rights of poor women in the global south. Reacting against the universalism of liberal feminists like Nussbaum, as well as to the events of September 11, 2001, Judith Butler framed those events as an opening to a radical new form of global feminism. Butler insisted that the experience of vulnerability among the privileged should catalyze a transnational counter-imperial feminist politics. So these feminist reinventions of the concept of vulnerability were channeled into climate research by a network of women trained in geography and identifying as feminists, a group that includes Diana Liverman, Susan Cutter, Karen O'Brien, and Maria Carmen Lemos. Um, and you can see here one example of this feminist vulnerability science, the Social Vulnerability Index introduced by Susan Cutter and collaborators in 2003, which is now, um, has ever since been widely used for instance, by FEMA to identify communities most at risk to um, climate and other hazards and to allocate, allocate disaster relief. So let me describe um, what I see as some characteristics of this feminist science of vulnerability. First, it evaluates research based on its uptake or usability rather than according to formal methods of empirical validation or solely um, on peer review. It promotes epistemological pluralism, accepting that different contexts call for different understandings of climate vulnerability. And it engages with competing forms of expertise, lay, local, and indigenous. In these ways, this feminist climate research has directed attention 
to what Cutter calls the vulnerabilities of science, meaning the limits to scientific certainty and to scientists' epistemic authority. Researchers who engaged with non-expert communities made themselves vulnerable by inviting critique. They also made their careers vulnerable since their, quote, outreach and applications were often illegible to academic promotion reviews. The careers they have carved out within and beyond academia have charted new models for feminist science. In feminist terms, this evolving discourse represents a critique of the ideal of the autonomy of the scientific researcher and a recognition that relationships of interdependence are foundational to knowledge making. Of course, this principle of relationality is central to indigenous philosophy of science that has long been resisted by scientists working in Euro-American contexts. Still, the scientific institutions within which these feminist researchers work exert constant pressure to deny these relations of interdependence. So for instance, since the institution of the UNFCCC Adaptation Fund in 2008, and the IPCC's turn to adaptation science, these feminist researchers have encountered resistance. They face pressure from physical scientists and the IPCC's working group one to settle on a uniform and objective method for assessing vulnerability, um, along with methods for validating its use. What's more, scholars of international relations have contended that their methodological pluralism is impeding negotiators from reaching consensus. Through the lens of intellectual history, we can recognize deep historical roots to this resistance. It echoes the Kantian fiction of the autonomy of the moral and epistemic subject. Kant posited the virtue of the moral subject as independent of fortune, much as he theorized the epistemic subject as transcending the contingencies that shape humans as creatures of the earth. A history of climate vulnerability then should attend to the presence of this past, the living legacy of two centuries of efforts to separate the knowing human subject from the human object of the geophysical influence. A history of climate vulnerability should examine carefully the echoes of past attempts to measure and compare the vulnerabilities of human populations to climatic phenomena, such as the racist and colonialist schemes of medical climatology and insurance of weather-related hazards. It should trace the repercussions of Kantianism in geography and related fields, the struggles of scientists to reckon with their own susceptibilities as earthlings. My hope then is that this history of thinking human vulnerability can contribute to fostering a climate science that is less adaptive than transformative. Thank you. Wonderful. And that's the perfect, uh, perfect closure to the, to the four talks, I think. I'm so excited as we move into the Q&A just about the cross-cutting themes, despite how seemingly on the surface different these four papers are. Um, I'm seeing themes of you know, the question of whose, whose knowledge, whose climate and environmental knowledge is privileged, whose scientific and historical knowledge is privileged, how do scientists and historians define their objects of study? What are researchers quantifying and why? Um, and what's the relationship between how we and our historical actors are envisioning, envisioning pasts and futures? So I'm gonna um, uh, remind you all, um, let's see, I wanna be able to see the Q&A, there it is, um, that you can type your questions into the Q&A box, but you can also uh, rate, click the raise your hand button and we much prefer that because that allows us to hear your voice when you ask your question. Um, I am going to um, maybe just take my prerogative as the, as the chair of this session to ask you one question to start us off and then we'll move over to audience Q&A. Um, so all four of your papers historicize science, historicize a variety of ways of knowing climate. Um, can you just speak briefly on this general question of um, why you think historicizing science and even in, in even critiquing it in, for example, discussing the tyranny, tyranny of numbers or how we define vulnerability, um, what role does the intellectual and cultural history of climate have to play in confronting climate change, you know, taking us to this bigger theme of the whole conference? 
um, and, and focusing it on this question of intellectual and cultural history of, of climate, which I think you're all addressing. Anyone wanna take up my really super broad question? I mean, so I'll take a stab. Um, so, I mean, I, I really think that proxies are our best source of information for vast stretches of Earth's history. Um, but by not historicizing it, we lack some of the sort of social and political context in which this data arose. Um, and some of some ideas of climate determinism, some ideas of um, societies that were particularly vulnerable to climate, right, with this like racial element of like, they couldn't possibly have survived these changes, but look at us, we can predict and get out of it, right, as sort of the Douglas's point of view. Um, and so I think that that historicization of these scientific um, data points tell us a little bit about who we were and who we believe we are, um, as we try and confront this crisis. So I think that's one of the reasons it's helpful. Go ahead, Clark. As well. So um, climate is not just something we, this, this um, climate change, and it's not something we tackle just through the lens of science, or we recognize that climate change and other aspects of uh, the environment uh, we experience it through different contexts as all of the people in this panel have uh, emphasized and um and for a time we we kind of relied historians kind of relied on this new proxy evidence from the natural archives and we were quite excited by it but lately we've come to realize that the humanities has something to contribute to the conversation that's why you have the rise of these programs in environmental humanities and uh, we're trying to argue that we have to approach this, prob um, this problem holistically um, and that historians and other disciplines in the humanities have something to contribute to this. And I see this very clearly in my research when I encounter resistance to um, my attempts to understand how typhoons were understood and, and how people manage them in other time periods and other, other regions outside of the US and Europe. And, um, I'm trying to get people to see that um, we can't just look at these past storms from the point of view of modern meteorology based in Western science and things like that. And that uh, we have much to gain by understanding how uh, people understood and saw storms um, and how they cope with them. Um, so that's kind of my take on this why I'm critiquing um, this obsession with what, this tyranny of numbers. Yeah. I, I might answer just from a slightly different angle than what I was speaking at that in my yeah. presentation, which is that I think it's important to recognize the centrality of historical reasoning to the scientific study of climate change, and, you know, along the lines of what Melissa presented. I was actually thinking about this during her presentation, and you know, often um, a certain um, population of physical scientists acts as gatekeepers um, trying to keep the scientific discourse focused on numbers, as, as Clark says, or on model predictions. Um, and, you know, we have um, um, historians of science like Ted Porter who tell us that those numbers are trusted, but actually I think there's a lot of evidence that historical narratives are much more compelling to the public than, you know, bare numbers. Yeah, that's great. Any, any others? I'm gonna um, take us to the first question that was typed in the Q&A. And uh, it's from Diana uh, Heredia Lopez, who was uh, on our first uh, graduate student panel. Um, if you wanna speak, Diana, you can click the raise your hand button, but um, uh, I will, oh, you do. Okay, great. I'm gonna allow her to talk now. Uh, can you, can you yes we can hear you we can hear you oh, okay yeah sorry that was a long question uh, it's kind of um, specific to Dr. Cherenko uh, just because I'm a person who has classified for aminifera and diatoms <laughs> I know this is not a straightforward process of obtaining proxies so I, I'm kind of trying to get at like at the more specific level of scientific practices like what makes possible for scientists to disassociate the human eye from some from some of these um, uh, practices of obtaining climate proxies. 
And it's kind of also, uh, it's also something that, that relates to how, how, what we consider a credible source or a credible uh, person who can produce climatic knowledge. Um, so I guess that also speaks to my, the other talks. Um, and I think also uh, Professor Cohen kind of also foreshadowed uh, a lot of that in her talk. Uh, and also, yeah, I know this is like a kind of a classic topic in history of science, but I'm, I'm just wondering if there is something distinctive about climate science. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm still trying to wrap my head around of whether there's something really distinctive with proxies. Um, I think some of them have really interesting features that we haven't accounted for well in history of science. Um, so th there are sort of past indirect measurements of climate. Most of our discussion of measuring is sort of in these lab based where you can test your instruments and you can continue to iterate in sort of this pass off chain in. Um, measurement practice, and that, that's just not true when the processes have happened in the past, but we do have, as historians of science, accounts of other historical sciences, whether that is um, geology, right, and so I'm trying to wrap my head around of whether proxies are unique in these ways, um, but I also think that there are some elements of proxies that are really difficult um, that we don't have great accounts for. Um, so I'm working on a piece on pollen's mobility, right? So not only is it this past-based science, the pollen is also blowing from all over the place as it arrives in a particular location. Um, and how do you verify where it's coming from? So how do you know the spatial scale? Um, and I think um, scientists are very aware. Um, I cover a lot of the different correction strategies that scientists work on, right? And I try to give a sense of that with the tree ring stuff that I talked about. It, like, it's not just counting rings, right? You have to do a lot of secondary studies to understand how the trees capture the pollen. Um, but I think some of us as humanists have sort of grabbed that data and not thought a lot about where it comes from. Some of the older stuff is not as uh, robust to some of the more recent work. Um, and so as historians using this data, we usually think a lot about our historical sources. And I think if we're going to draw on proxies, and I think Clark's uh, piece today talked a little bit about that too, of like, what are the limits of this information? Um, and we've, we've thought about that in modeling uh, as historians quite a lot, but this proxies are this like other really important part of our climate picture. And I think we've done less of that and I'm trying to do some of that work. Great. I think, um, Erica, you have a question next, right? Yeah, thank you for those um, wonderful papers. Um, one of the things about grouping them all together, one of the things that became clear to me is you're all addressing, I mean, we gave you the topic of historicizing the climate uh, crisis, but one of the things you all talked about or engaged with was, was the idea of how knowledge is created and then how that knowledge is used or not used um, in different um, formats. So, you know, um, Clark brought up this idea of the gatekeeper um, and Debbie, you sort of talk about this too, about when scientists are listening or when they're not. Melissa, you are as well. And Jorge, certainly, um, whose voices get heard. So I'm wondering if each of you could address, um, are there precedents from your work that might be helpful for us moving forward in terms of how we get people to listen to alternative voices, alternative frameworks, the humanities, for instance, as one of those in terms of climate change discussions. So sort of a big question, a sort of meta question for the panelists. I guess I'm just asking about, are there precedents from your case studies that you could sort of draw lessons for in terms of moving forward? So one of the themes of the, the conference is not just historicizing, but also thinking about, you know, how your research informs contemporary policy debates too. And if one of those policy debates or not policy debates or one of those sort of larger social debates is, do the humanities matter? And where do they fit in these larger discussions? How do we sort of take lessons from the past? And I heard in your question, a question about the interdisciplinarity, right? These are all in a wider range of ways, uh, the history of science or history of knowledge is. And um, so there's, there's an interdisciplinary aspect there. How, how do we, how do we um, connect between sciences and, and history and humanities perspectives through, through what you're doing? I mean, some of you are quite directly offering um, contextualization of material that, 
that other researchers are dealing with in day to day from, from climate proxies to the idea of vulnerability um, to, uh, well, also, also in Clark's piece, the um, uh, what records can be used and how. Um, and Jorge, and more, more, you know, not just scientists, but historians and what, what um, uh, whose stories are being included or not included uh, or celebrated or not celebrated. Um, I don't know if, if that helps respond to, yeah, Clark, go ahead. I, I feel that Deborah kind of said it best at the end of her response earlier mm -hmm. when she said that people nowadays are more compelled by narrative, many more people are compelled by narratives um, rather than simply models. And I see that in my own work, even though I've encountered resistance from scientists when I'm dealing with most other people, like in talks I've given in Taiwan or China, or even just in the classroom when I teach climate history courses, people are just more taken by climate narratives that are fully contextualized in their social political um, contexts and you know we back them up we back up our assertions with science of course with the numbers but uh, by being able to flesh out the implications at a local level at a very highly contextualized um, pick in a, a highly contextualized picture my students are more compelled by these kinds of stories and inspired by them than just being told this these are the numbers this is what we're going to face and i think that's really what uh, everybody in this panel is trying to do yeah. yeah i guess i have an example um mm -hmm. from my work um so paul sear is one of the popularizers of pollen analysis in the united states um, writes a piece on the Dust Bowl in the 1930s where he doesn't talk much at all about pollen analysis, even though the newspapers writing about his book, Deserts on the March, um, you know, say he's a pollen analyst, but then say like, but because he can write this narrative where he's drawing on past examples of damage from all over the world, um, that's why this book wins the Book of the Month Club, right? So he's really able to translate his scientific findings to this narrative structure, which causes people to be concerned. Um, so I think what Clark said is right, and here's an example of it. Can I just add one last thing? Yeah. Whenever I survey my climate history students, and I, I get a lot of environmental science and other science majors in my classes, they tell me that they would rather read a 50 page history reading <laughs> than a five page science article. Like that's, that's always what they tell me which I, I find very fascinating, given that we tend to think students don't want to read. I was curious uh, about the relationship between um, vulnerability and resilience, um, which I see as sort of interrelated, and it's there in the 1979 um, World Climate Conference, right? The next word was, or you're resilient. Um, but I also think of resilient as coming slightly later. Um, so I wondered if that's right and where agency is if you're vulnerable versus where agency is if you are resilient. Great question. Um, and actually one of the things that convinced me that we need to write a feminist history of climate science was um, reading an account recently that said that vulnerability had been replaced by resilience mm -hmm. historically. Not true. <laughs> um, it, so resilience is theorized by the ecologist Buzz Holling in the late 70s, just around the time of that World Climate Conference. And it follows a separate trajectory um, in um, complexity theory and ecology, um, pretty far from the feminist vulnerability science that I'm tracing. Only very recently have those frameworks been brought together and somewhat reconciled in the past like, few years. Um, but resilience is a really different concept. Um, it is a systemic property, whereas vulnerability um, is vulnerability at every level of analysis, right, it's of individuals. And it's, it really focuses attention on the um, differentiation, right, on um, differentials across a population um, versus resilience, which is like all or nothing, survival or collapse. We have a question in the Q&A that's also for you, Debbie. Um, this is from Andy Gerhardt. Uh, thank, you for, thank you all for this excellent conference. 
Dr. Cohen, how can a feminist science of vulnerability reframe some of the apocalyptic narratives that Dr. DeMuth treated in her keynote just before this? Um, does it result in the same framework of crisis or are there other less paralyzing and more resilient framings that arise? Mm, that's a wonderful question. And I, I really appreciate Bathsheba's um, analysis of that discourse. One um, element of this feminist science that intrigues me is, a, as I mentioned at the very end, is a turn from talking about adaptive to transformative science. Um, and I think transformative science is um, resisting the apocalyptic framing um, by saying, and it, it's, a, it's also resisting the kind of glib hope um, that Bathsheba was also critiquing in saying, in, saying, okay, scientists engage with a community, the community offers a vision of where they want to be in the future. And the scientists work with them to figure out how they can get there, right? That that would be a transformative science. It's narrative driven. It is, um, it depends on humanistic thinking because it's all about the imagination, right? Um, and it's, it's not apocalyptic because it's all about moving forward, but not in a, a you know, passive, way of hoping. We already started to touch on this, but maybe we can dig a little bit deeper. I, the other big connection I'm seeing across the talks is this question about whose knowledge gets to count, whose knowledge is privileged, um, not only in climate science, but in our historiographies. And I'm wondering if you could, um, maybe I can ask you to try to make connections across your talks, if that's possible here, right? Because I see that at play in terms of Jorge, how uh, Latin American um, scientists were obscured by this Humboldtian narrative in Clark, how, um, how climate historians kind of pushed to the side um, these Chinese sources and in Deborah, especially how you're talking about, um, well, I guess the, the careers of the feminist scholars who you're talking about, maybe it applies less in Melissa's case, but, but maybe I'm just not thinking broadly enough, but I don't know if you guys can find, um, why does it matter that we look at histories of whose knowledge counted or not um, in terms of confronting climate? Well, I think it matters in, in terms of uh, whose political solutions matter mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and who bears the cost of those political solutions and, 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 and who gets saved and who gets drowned. Um, so it's, it's a matter of not only who is silenced in the historiography, but it's also uh, what do we do with all this knowledge ultimately? And, and uh, it's like with vaccines today. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, uh, two thirds of the world are still waiting for the vaccine for the eldest, uh, whereas uh, in the United States we are, I mean, 50% of the population is already vaccinated. Um, it, it is the, the ill distribution not only of authority and knowledge, but it's the ill distribution of, um, of resources to address the outcomes of, um, of climate change, uh, COVID being one of them. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's right. Um, and I think it is there in my case too. Um, so if we look mostly at sort of modeling and earth and atmospheric science accounts of climate, we, we have this sort of large scale focus um, and some of the ranges and resolutions of proxy data just sort of allow sort of these different scalar imaginations allows you to focus on earth right if you're using um, biological proxies like pollen and vegetation you have those in your conception of the world in ways that your climate models don't um, and so i think that matters a lot to responsibility and sort of the political systems that can imagine and think through the future in certain ways. Can I ask a small question to Clark? Please. Um, I, it, it struck me that um, 
your paper was a critique of um, understanding climate through numbers, but you did mention that your historical actors were interested in the number of typhoons per season, right? And reading that off plants. So can you say a little bit more about what that number meant to them? So, um, yeah, while I was critiquing numbers, I was critiquing particularly the numbers that uh, certain historical climatologists steeped in you know, modern meteorology and wanting to map out numbers of storms in the past and frequencies and categories. And what I was trying to say in my paper is that um, people in the in South China Post, they did use numbers, but not necessarily in the way in which these historical climatologists use them. And I, I, what I was arguing is that I, I, want, I hope that um, these could be taken more seriously um in, in a way that I haven't seen them um, been accepted. So I often when I present at conferences when there are meteorologists or paleo uh, climatologists there they ask me, well can you tell me about that typhoon? Is it a category one? Is it a category mm -hmm. three? And I say I can't tell you that. Yeah. But I can tell you that this year these these people um Thought that there would be three typhoons, and this is how they prepared for them, and that's that's what I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems it doesn't to them; it's not interesting or not useful, not useful knowledge. But um, I think it is useful knowledge. <laughs> and to me, that takes to me your answer and really all the talks together come back to a point that Deborah, you ended your your talk with in terms of the need for pluralism and. And uh, in in knowledge and in and in how we deal with the values associated with dealing with the scientific knowledge that we do have. So uh, we're coming up on time, and perhaps there is a great place to stop. I I just really want to thank these four uh, speakers for really deep and excellent um, papers and for such interesting interconnections among them and looking forward to continuing the conversation with you all and all the other participants. Um, this is gonna conclude the, uh, this session concludes the public events for today. Um, I'll say for those uh, in the audience who are on the conference program, speakers and chairs, I do hope you can join us for the informal reception that will start at uh, five o'clock. If you're not tired of Zoom yet, uh, really just touching base to, to, to have a little bit of that scholarly community um, informally at five o'clock would be great. Um, for everyone else, uh, thank you for being here. Many of you have been here all day, <laughs> which is wonderful. And I hope you can uh, join us, come back tomorrow to continue the conversation. Tomorrow we start at 8 a.m. Central. Um, and you can uh, see in the chat is a link to the full program. Um, we'll be continuing with sessions on, um, on the causes and consequences of the climate crisis and on um, public history and how historians can practice what we preach, et cetera. So I'm really looking forward to continuing with you all tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>